Um, so next week is Easter. You can hear me now. You can respond. Woohoo! So we just have a small tool, just an invite. It's also online, so you could share through text message. But I also want to tell you about eKids. eKids is putting together this awesome experience for your kiddos or your kiddos' friends, and they're going to have a special guest like you heard. So I just want to, and there's a little special surprise for the little ones. I'm so excited. Um, I can't tell you, otherwise it wouldn't be a surprise. Um, but it's going to be really awesome. So I really, really hope that you um, invite friends and that you come and celebrate with us because Jesus is alive. I expected you to, like, jump in, but... Maybe I'm expecting too much for 9.45 in the morning. <laughs> but hi, welcome. My name's Ilsian. I'm one of the lead pastors here, and I'm so grateful to have you join us today. If this is your first time, we would love to say hello. There's a connection card in the seat pocket in front of you. Let us know who you are. You might even get a little gift card to a coffee place if you do that. So thanks. Um, but you know, when Jesus told a story, he was so good at shock value. He was so good at it. And according to the Merriam-Webster, shock value is defined as the usefulness of something to surprise and usually upset people. There are movies, advertisements, telenovelas. Any telenovela watchers up in here? It's okay if you are. It's okay if you are. No judgment. That's the soap opera, but in Spanish. Telenovela. And then there's tweets, or is that what, what are we calling them now? X, X's? It just sounds weird. Anyway, what used to be tweet, Twitter? Um, they really go for shock value. And like, um, there is one that was shared in uh, two years ago on International Women's Day out of all days. And so I want to share that with you. Mm hmm. And uh, I saw somebody in the other service high-fiving, two men high-fiving each other. I was like, I know who I'm preaching at today. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, how does that make you feel, right? It evokes an emotion. It evokes a reaction, especially for women. It should. Um, but see, what you don't see in this headline is the explanation below. So let's look at the next picture, and you'll see the explanation below. And, of course, they say, if they want to, of course, and they talk about how only 20% of um, chefs are women, and they give their why behind that headline. But that marketing stunt really backlashed on them. It was not a good marketing stunt for BK. They had to delete the tweet. It was not good. Women were not pleased by it at all. And so, you know, shock value gets people's attention. It draws people in. It causes a reaction. And Jesus, Jesus was such a good storyteller. See, the shock value that he used came not because of a marketing stunt, but at the revelation of how scandalous the grace of God is. It reminds me of a song in Spanish. Escandalo, es un escandalo, escandalo. No, only me? Okay. Um, <laughs> but it's talking about scandal, like it's scandalous, the grace of God is shocking. And see, the story that Dr. Luke pens in chapter 15 of Luke is a revelation of the heart of God. And that portrait of God is so shocking to a group of people known as the Pharisees and the scribes. See, they had made it their life to study the Torah, the Old Testament. So if anyone should know about God is them. But in the story, the actions of both the sons, both sons, and the response of the father are like crazy shock value to the audience that is listening to Jesus tell the story. And in the previous chapter, Jesus sets the stage for the opening of chapter 15. And he addresses the crowd with these words. He says, let anyone with ears 
to hear, listen. So right when chapter 15 opens up, the first verse, it says tax collectors and other notorious sinners came to listen to Jesus teach. What were they doing? They were leaning in. They were leaning in. Jesus set the stage. He invited them. Let those who have ears to listen, let them hear. Let them listen. And so they do. But along with them, along with that crowd, is also the Pharisees and the scribes. So they are there for the storytelling as well. And see, this story with the title of the prodigal son or the lost son is a well-known story, known both by Christian and non-Christian alike. There is an idiom that says the prodigal son returns, right? We hear it all the time, and it's often used in parables or stories that Jesus told need to be seen through cultural glasses. So today, I'm going to put on my cultural glasses, and with the help of Bible scholars like Kenneth E. Bailey and Roger E. Van Horn and Tim Keller, I will put on my cultural glasses, make a few observations that we find in this story, and invite you to respond. So let's read, because we are reading a lot today. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, I hope you came ready to read. 21 verses, let's go. It says this in chapter 15 of, of Luke and verses 11 through 32. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told him this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land and there he wasted all his money and wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. Yeah, that's what sin does. Leaves you starving. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding, the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Verse 20, so he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick! Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and kill the calf. We have been fattening because we're going to grub. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and now he has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Let the party begin. And it would be a great story if it just ended there because it's a pretty awesome story, but it doesn't end there. There is another character that was introduced at the beginning. So verse 25 says, meanwhile, the older son was in the fields of working when he returned home and he heard the music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fat calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry, and he wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. 
Yet when your this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fat calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me. And everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now is found. From the moment the story starts, Jesus engages the audience. And see, because right at the opening verses, we get to see this picture of a younger son completely insulting his father. See, in Middle Eastern culture, the people hearing this would have gasped. Like, how dare you speak to your father that way, right? It's a shocker. It's like the son was saying, Dad, drop dead already. That's what he was saying with what he was asking. And in this culture, the son owed loyalty and respect to the father. And the expectation was for the father to get angry. It was for him to slap the boy across the face. Imagine Teens, if your parents did that to you, hopefully they don't. If they do, come talk to me. But imagine if they slap, he, that's what the expectation was. The expectation was the father, he was supposed to get angry. He was supposed to slap him across the face. Not only that, he was supposed to drive him out of the house. But that is not what happens in this story. And that is a complete shocker to everyone hearing Jesus share this story. See, the father agrees and divides his wealth between the two sons. And it continues on because, see, the, the shock value just continues to increase because in Jesus' time, it was a land-based economy. And for a Jewish family, it was important to hold on to ancestral lands. And their belief was that it was God who had blessed them and given them this land. So selling it was out of the question. But we see that the younger son does that. He sells it. He pockets the money. And then we see him going off into a distant land. See, another note to take about the culture is that relationships were valued above individual freedom. But this young son wanted freedom without relationship. He wanted no commitment in relationship, just all the freedom. So he distanced himself, no longer able to live in relationship with his father, with his family, and with his community. And it goes on to say that it gets so bad. You guys heard us read the story, the detail that Jesus introduces to this point would definitely get the what in the world shock look in the audience's face. Because see, he introduces this young Jewish man going and working with the pigs. And see, Jewish people believe the pigs were not kosher. Like that is something. You know, it was a curse. It was believed to be a curse for you to even work or care for pigs. But yet there he was. Hanging out, feeding, working, trying to survive. And see, This young man, we can say that he did anything that he could to get him ostracized, broken off, and disowned. All that he did would have gone in there. But he comes to his senses. This young man realizes. He comes to his senses. So what does he do? He returns home and he realizes, I could be eating better as a servant. And so he says that he returns home but this is where it gets really shocking. While he is a long ways off, the father sees him. And he's filled with compassion. That's what Jesus did for you and me. While we were yet 
still sinners. He died for us, right? So the father, filled with compassion, runs to him. And see, culturally, what would take place in such a case after the son's actions would bring so much shame on the son, on the father, but also the village it would bring shame on the village. And you know what the father did? He's like, before they condemn you and throw shame on you, I'm going to lift up my robe and I'm going to run and show my like something that a Palestinian patriarch would never do. He does and he runs to him and he says, throw shame on me. I'll take on the shame. I will shame myself so that you don't have to bear it. And he goes and he runs after him. And he embraces him and he kisses him. And you got to remember, the son was yucky. I mean, just this morning, Charlie, after eating yogurt, wanted to hug me. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm wearing white pants today. Like, stay away. I know. And she started crying. Thank God Carl's was there. Um, but that was me to my little three-year-old. Like, this father. This, this young man had been hanging out and feeding and working, feeding pigs. So he was a mess. I could just imagine. Probably smelled. And there wasn't deodorant back then. So he really smelled. <laughs> like it was, like you got to get the picture of what's happening. Otherwise you'll miss how shocking this is. This man was considered unclean, yet his father runs to him, embraces him, and kisses him. And it's not just a one-time kiss, but the kiss that is described in the story is a repeated kiss over and over again. See, according to scholars, this embrace and kiss are a public sign of reconciliation. It was the sign that the father was saying, I am reconciling you back into relationship. And the son had practiced his speech of what he would say. But the last thing that he got to say was, I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But the father doesn't let him finish because he says, quick, bring the finest robe. And you know who the finest robe belonged to? To the father. The father's the one that owned the finest robe. So he's like, put it on him. That's what, that's such a great picture. What happens to us in our nakedness, in our shame. He loves us so much that he covers us. And he does that. And he covers him. But he says, get a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And see, the last thing that the son had said is, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the ring being placed on his finger meant you are my son. You have not lost your identity I am restoring your identity and who you are. And he does that. And he puts sandals on his feet. And the sandals on his feet meant that he was no longer a slave or a servant because servants or slaves would be barefoot. But if you were a son, if you were a free man, you would be wearing sandals. So, gee, so, so this, this picture, this image is he is getting sandals on, which means you are free no longer. A slave to sin. And so I love that there was a fat calf. Because there's nothing I love more than asada. If you ever want to have me over and have no idea what to feed me, asada. But see, it meant that it was a special location, but it also meant that the whole community was invited to celebrate in the restoration of relationship. And the party begins because this son is found. And, and I love that it wasn't the son's actions that reconciled him. But it was what the father's response was that reconciled the son back to relationship. So friends, it's not what we can do or what we have done, but it's what Jesus did on the cross for us 
that reconciles us. Is the Father giving us his son, Jesus, that reconciles us to relationship with the Father? But see, there is another character that we read about in the story. It would be a great story. But, you know, it goes on and it says the older brother was angry and he wouldn't go in. And see, just as the father went out to meet the younger son, the father also went out to try to beg the older brother to come in. So once again, the father is going against the cultural norm and humiliates himself so that he could bring the other son in. God cares about every single one of his children. The father wants relationship with every single one of his children. So he tries to convince them to come back in. And we see that the older brother is livid. And he uses these words. He says, all these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me. You know what that reminded me of as I was studying? It reminded me of Revelations 2, verses 2 through 4. And that passage says, I know all the things you do. It was Jesus speaking to the church in Ephesus. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work, but I have one complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Return to your first love. But see, it's not just love to Jesus, but love to one another. And I think it's so easy for us, especially around election time, to forget to love each other. We forget to love one another, and we place principle before relationship. But this story, it places relationship above your rights and your freedoms. It says relationship matters. And so God is calling us back. Would you come back to the first love? You've done all this work. You've served so well. But man, you have forgotten your first Love, you have forgotten to love me, to be with me. I think a lot of times we do, we do, and we do, and we work, and we forget that we are supposed to be with him, not just do for him. When somebody just does and does and does and doesn't enjoy the joy of relationship, you know what happens? Burnout. Resentment. All that we see this son going through in our duty of doing for the father, in his duty of doing for the father, he has forgotten to love and adore him, to have the intimacy and relationship with the father and with his brother. You see, in the son's speech, the older son's speech, he doesn't say my brother. He says this son of yours. He is cutting himself off from relationship with his brother. And see, this, this older son, as far as we know, he's lived a moral life. He had worked. He had done all this for the father. And he had also received his part of the inheritance. And I find it interesting how in the two previous stories in chapter 15, people go after what's lost. But in this story, no one goes after the son. And I wonder if the older brother could have done that. Could he use his resources to go after him and restore him back to relationship? I don't know. But he, maybe he could have but see, if we are living or if you find yourself in a place where there is no sense of joy and freedom in the way that you serve and love God or come to the Father's house, and it's not just about Sundays, 
But see, you are the dwelling place of God. So it's every day with you at home, with your family, if there is no sense of joy and freedom, then maybe we need to realize that, man, I've been living like the elder brother. I've been sitting on my high horse of morals and rights and freedoms, and maybe I need to surrender that. The late Tim Keller in his book, The Prodigal God, writes, they, talking about the Pharisees and the scribes, were offended and infuriated. Jesus' purpose is not to warm our hearts, but to shatter our categories. Through this parable, Jesus challenges what everyone thinks about God, he says. And I'm going to invite the band to come up. See, just as the son was reckless in his spending, his inheritance, the father is reckless in loving his son. He is reckless in the way that he loves you, that he loves me. But are we responding to his love? See, because his father, this, the story ends like this. It says, his father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now is found. The story Ends and we are not giving an ending. We are not giving an ending. We don't know what the older brother does. Because you are invited to join in the party and finish the story. You are invited to join in. You are invited to finish this story. In his grace... It is very shocking. It doesn't make sense how a father's love could be so reckless. He pretty much sold and gave the inheritance way before. And he embraced and he kissed and he loved. And I don't know, maybe when you're hearing the story, there are parts that you really relate to that you say, man, that's me or man, that's been me or man, I don't really know. But, you know, for me, I remember when I was far away from God, I had distanced myself from God. This is the story that God used to bring me back. And I remember it was so hard to come back. Because I kept thinking, there's no way, no way God can forgive what I've done. If you only knew how badly I've messed up, I don't think he wants me. I'm too much of a sinner for him. But I remember walking into what I didn't know was a Spanish service. Because I had sworn I'd never go to Spanish church again. Because there was so much pain with that and here is this beautiful girl singing vuelve a casa which means return home and it's a song beautifully melodically telling the story of the prodigal son and I knew that God had orchestrated that moment just so that I would say take me messed up I've sinned pretty bad and see someone like me with that kind of history should not be standing here today sharing God's word with you but by the grace of God and it's only his grace that brings us this far and so now I look at this story and I thank God for all his grace, but I also got to be careful that I don't become like the older brother because it's so easy once we've walked with God to forget of all he has done. We think, oh, I'm praying. I am reading my Bible. I'm doing all the, it's not about all the things. Those are very helpful. They're very good disciplines. 
but it's about intimacy and relationship with the Father. Would you love him? Come back to him. Would you close your eyes right where you are? I'm going to invite you to respond to this word. See, because in this whole chapter, it started with one out of 100, one sheep. 99 were left, one sheep was found. Then there was one out of 10. And then it gets down to one out of two. And I think it's a clever way of saying that there is no acceptable margin of loss for God. The Father's heart is for all to be found. So with your eyes closed, Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to help us know how to respond to this word. Lord, if it's surrendering our pride, our spiritual pride, that we would surrender. If it's surrendering our rights that we've placed over relationships, Lord, that we would be able to do that. Lord, if it's coming back because we distance ourselves from you, thank you that your arms are wide open and that you embrace and restore us to relationship with you. So Holy Spirit, would you speak right now to every heart, to every mind, here in this room and joining us online. Where are we in this story? And how are we to respond? With everybody's eyes closed, if you're in this room, and maybe you've related to like, man, there's no way that God can take me back. Or maybe you've been so far away from God and today you want to say, I want to come back to God. You want to put your faith in Jesus and follow him today. I want to invite you right there where you are with everybody's eyes closed. If that's you and that's a decision you want to make today, would you look up at me so that I can agree with you? I see you. I agree with you. I see you. I agree with you. If there's anybody else, look up at me so that I can agree with you. I see you. I agree with you. If there's anybody else, I see you. I agree with you. I see you. I agree with you. I see you. I agree with you. Lord, we thank you that you love us so wildly. You are for us. So Lord, we want to respond with the promise and the hope that not only you dying on the cross, but you raising from the dead brings that you are good, that you are faithful. And Lord, help us be people that make room for those that are coming back. Help us be people that make room for those that need to be brought in to party. Lord, if there are people here that have stayed outside of the celebration that you want us to take a part of, Lord, help us to come back. Help us to finish the story. Lord, we love you. Would you sing the song as we end our service, singing the song today?